Children's Bureau. Child Welfare Evaluation Virtual Summit Series. Children's Bureau. The Child Welfare Evaluation Virtual Summit Series was made possible by the Children's Bureau. Develop and Test, Compare and Learn, Part 3 of 5. Welcome back to our discussion about building evidence and spreading effective practice in child welfare. In the first video in this series, my partner and I talked about the need to build evidence in child welfare and why this can be so challenging. Then we introduced the framework to design, test, spread, and sustain effective child welfare practice, a practical guide designed to help child welfare decision makers, evaluators, and funders support evidence-based practice. In a nutshell, the five phases of the framework form a complete process that includes identifying and exploring a problem, developing and testing a solution, rigorously evaluating the intervention, adapting and spreading interventions that work, and applying, monitoring, and continuously improving them over time. In the second video, we presented the first of the framework's five phases, identify and explore. If you haven't seen those videos, it may be helpful to watch them before viewing this one the third in this five-part series. An animated man and woman. We're going to imagine that we've already carefully examined a problem and thoughtfully researched possible solutions based on our theory of change during the identify and explore phase. Which phase of the framework we enter next depends on the intervention we've selected, its evidence base, and whether or not it's already been implemented. In this case, we've decided that existing evidence-supported interventions are not available to address our problem and the needs of our target population. So we're going to design a new intervention. That means our next phase will be develop and test. Whether that's a narrowly focused discrete practice like using a particular family conferencing approach, a larger systemic change like adopting a casework practice model, or a sweeping policy reform like extending services to youth in foster care beyond the age 18, our intervention must be clearly defined so that everyone understands what it is and how it's different from what we're already doing. Shapes fill a box. This means specifying the intervention's core components or the elements that are most important for the intervention to work. Let me offer an example. Our county hopes to reduce the number of children experiencing brief and repeated stays in foster care. For the past six months, we've worked with program experts, private providers, and community partners to design a new community-based family preservation model. We want to prevent unnecessary removals and keep children safe in their homes. We've been reviewing articles and reports about intensive family preservation approaches and other home-based services, like home visiting, but there isn't an existing evidence-supported program that really meets our needs. Instead, we're building on what's been learned in these programs, identifying the core components, and setting our own standards for things like program eligibility, structure, and content, as well as worker qualifications and training. Our agency's current family preservation services are unstructured and inconsistent by comparison. Can you say more about how you're developing the intervention? Sure. Each core component is tied to our theory of change about why kids are repeatedly being placed in foster care for short periods of time. We've learned that children who bounce back and forth between their homes and short-term placements in our county often have challenging behaviors and special needs. Their caregivers feel overwhelmed and ineffective when parenting, particularly when family conflict escalates into crisis. These families haven't been successful despite having access to our current services. By providing high-intensity in-home services with core components that include weekly caseworker visits, 24-hour on-call support, home-based parent education and coaching, and access to additional resources like youth mentoring and trauma-focused therapy, we expect to meet these families' needs while keeping children safe in their homes and preventing future placement in foster care. After we define clear and measurable standards for each core component, they will become the basis for a program manual and an in-home curriculum for families. We'll also have to design evaluation instruments with your help to track whether we're actually delivering all of the core components as intended. So that's the development part. That's right. After that, we will pilot the program with one or more small subsets of workers and families. The test of development and test. Yes. Starting with a small subset, we'll test processes like program referrals and identify barriers to implementation. This also serves as a kind of test run to make sure that all of the core components are in place and the program is working the way we'd planned. And if not, it's a great time to make adjustments. The cartoon woman it's drives a car. This is also an opportunity to ensure that short-term outcomes are being achieved 
and to refine the core components if needed. The develop and test phase ends when the intervention has been defined well enough that others can replicate it. The core components are clear and no longer need adjustment, and evaluation findings suggest that the intervention is associated with improved outcomes. This leads us into the next phase of the framework, compare and learn. The purpose of compare and learn is to determine whether, on average, the intervention results in better outcomes for children and families than an alternative. Based on the evaluation findings, decision makers, funders, evaluators, and other stakeholders decide whether there is convincing evidence that the intervention works better than services as usual. Steps in this phase include designing a rigorous evaluation involving an intervention and a comparison group, collecting data, performing analysis to draw conclusions, and using data to dig deeper, when possible, to determine whether the intervention was more or less effective for certain groups of people or under certain conditions. The researcher in me likes this phase. I thought you might. Do you have any examples that would fit? Yes, I think I might have the perfect one. I once worked with an agency that wanted to test the effectiveness of a parenting program for first-time parents. A one-hour-a-week classroom-based parenting program was considered standard for first-time mothers and fathers involved with this agency, and a weekly home-visiting parenting program was the new intervention it wanted to test. This sounds like a great example. What were the results? Hold on. I think you're skipping a few steps. In order to do a good job of comparing the standard program with the new intervention, we used a lottery process to assign all parents referred to the agency to either the classroom-based program or the new home visiting program. This random assignment helped to ensure that the two groups of parents were as similar as possible. For example, the lottery system protected against the possibility that parents in the new home visiting program were more motivated at the start than parents in the regular program. So what sort of differences in outcomes are we talking about? Well, the classroom-based teachers and home-based teachers kept track of attendance and participation and I measured parents' confidence in their abilities to care for their children. We also tracked longer-term outcomes, such as children's entry into foster care during and after the program ended. The agency also gathered personal stories and feedback through interviews and focus groups with parents. Parents in the home visiting program said that being able to interact with their children while learning the parenting techniques made a big difference. A woman pushes a girl on, on a swing. Hand, parents who attended the regular parenting classes reported that they had difficulty remembering the techniques well enough to be able to use them when they returned home. Ultimately, the outcome data seemed to support these stories. Comparison tests revealed important statistically significant differences in outcomes between the two programs. Parents who participated in the home visiting parenting program reported greater confidence in their parenting skills and their children experienced fewer entries into foster care. That is some amazing work. And as a result, it sounds like the agency gained convincing evidence that children of parents who received home-based services were safer in comparison to those who received classroom-based services. This kind of strong evidence is really helpful to hear. We also collected important information about how closely the agency followed the core components of the home visiting program, its delivery, and parents' participation. This loyalty to the intervention as planned is what we call intervention fidelity. Tracking fidelity may allow us to look more carefully at why some parents fared better than others within the home visiting group. Because the agency made the commitment to complete Compare and Learn and partnered to make the evaluation a success, it was able to justify and form decisions about parenting programs in the future. Families a US that map. Said, it's important to remember that because this evaluation was only conducted with parents served by one agency, more study will be needed to determine if similar results can be expected for other populations, like moms and dads with different demographic characteristics and living in other geographic regions. Thanks. You seamlessly transitioned into our next phase, which is replicate and adapt. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for this segment, but be sure to watch our next video where we discuss the next two phases in the framework to design, test, spread, and sustain effective child welfare practice. Join us for part four. You can find the publication, A Framework to Design, Test, Spread, and Sustain Effective Practice in Child Welfare on the Children's Bureau website. Special thanks. A list of names follows, including Diane DePanphyllis, Renda Dion, Ruth Hubner, and Mark Testa. This video was created by Paltech Inc.
Child Welfare Evaluation Virtual Summit Series.